right, Moose, we got a great one today, man. We have our first repeat guest. Mike Milbury joins us, but he brought his line mates from the NHL NBC crew, Patrick Sharp and Catherine Tappan. Thank you all. You guys were all shaking off the rust here, kind of getting back into work. And you guys are trying to get back into the flow of it. And Catherine, I would imagine that you're kind of you're kind of run point for all these guys. And uh, your first your first experience with Mike Milbury <laughs> sounds like as as on television sounds like it kind of toughened you up. Walk us through that. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's funny because when we're all on the road together, I usually you know we get the group emails telling us where we're going, what we're supposed to do. Um, you know, and then it's always a follow-up text from one of these guys or Edzo or Joel. Hey, where are we supposed to be again tomorrow? So I tend to, yeah, I tend to, to I'm happily playing the point person for all of them. They make me look good every night. But uh, Mike Milbury, the first time we worked together was um, back in 2007, I want to say. I was covering the Patriots beat and the Red Sox. And, um, and they asked me to come in for an audition because this guy was coming in to – audition may, may, may be the GM, but he may be an analyst. And I said, okay, no problem. So I left my desk and the package I was preparing for Patriots. And I sit on the set with Mike and we just bantered. I teed him up on the four questions they wrote out for me to ask him. And I went back to my desk to work my Patriots beat. And next thing I know, the producer came over and said, so uh, you know, you're going to be the new host of Boston Bruins hockey, right? And I was like, I'm sorry, what? But Bruins at the time were the worst team in the, in the town. Patriots were like on course to be a Super Bowl champ again. They were undefeated. The Red Sox were running the show. I'm like, the Bruins? I said, no, 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 no. Sure enough, I ended up working with Mike uh, that season. But I will say between Mike and Nifty and Gordy and um, Barry Peterson, I mean, that's how I learned the game. I just sat in the control room and teed them up and, you know, I let them go. I kind of stayed out of their way, but I was listening the whole time and just taking it all in and getting the lingo down and getting the, you know, the information that I needed to be good at my job. But Mike was, yeah, I mean, I, I it was a little intimidating because I knew he was old school hockey and probably thought not too much of this, you know, football baseball reporter that was now coming in to host the show. <laughs> I had to win him over. Now, I think you did. 11 years, like 12 years later, <laughs> he's still <laughs> stuck with me. <laughs> Mike, did you, Mike, you know, I'm, I'm just curious. We had heard from a little bird that sometimes you're a little critical of Patrick's look. Let's just say, <laughs> are you approving you the right beard now? thing going on there? Yeah, no, that's, uh, you know, the grody look isn't me, although I haven't shaved in a couple of days and you wouldn't know it because I keep <laughs> growing a beard. But, um, no, Patrick's, Patrick made a really smooth transition into the business. I mean, he's obviously uh, had some great success in his career and, and uh, had a wealth of experience to bring to it. But the toughest part about getting into this business is to feel comfortable in front of the camera. And obviously, you've been interviewed enough times, but it's a different story when the, the heat is on and you have to come up with um, something instantly and Patrick was very good at uh, first listening and then taking in some of the stuff that Jonesy and I might offer him and uh, very quickly became comfortable in, in front of the camera. It was, a, it was amongst all the people that came in to, to do the job, um, the guy that was made the smoothest transition was Patrick with his grody look at all. Uh, now, do you approve going, of the backwards hat and the scruff right now, Mike? I mean, is this allowed? Right. All, all bets are off right now. I mean, I'm, I just came in from the garden, uh, you know, dirty fingernails and smelly armpits. <laughs> I'm the same too, way, too guys. When I'm on the air. What? <laughs> too much information? No, just clean it up before we go back on set together because I don't want right. to smell that. <laughs> do you, do you, Patrick, we, we were considering uh, almost – leaving you on the bench for this one. I mean, you did, you did have a hand in beating the Bruins 2013 cup run. Um, we were talking earlier, give us uh, give us some insights, maybe a good story, something about that series. I know we, you were saying that one thing you didn't want to do was piss off the Bruins, get into a fighting, you know, a fighting situation with them and, and really let your skating do the talking. Yeah, looking back to that series, 2013, we had just watched the Bruins win in 2011 uh, with a lot of the same guys. Same core group was kind of intact. Uh, our Blackhawks core had won in 2010, so we had great respect for what the Bruins could do. Uh, and they had all different styles of play, if you remember that group. And 
Um, we felt that back in 2011 when Boston played against Vancouver, they were just playing hockey with Vancouver. And those teams that the Canucks had were as good as it gets offensively, uh, playmaking, very skilled teams. And it wasn't until the Bruins really got mad, got angry, whether it was Burroughs' biting of the finger, whether it was the big hit uh, on Horton, whatever it was, the Bruins woke up, they started playing like bullies, and they took that series over. So from the Hawks' standpoint, you know, we, we knew they had a good team, five on five, playing skill. We just didn't want to wake him up too much and get them angry. And it turned out to be a great series. A uh, game that we won this cup in uh, game six was, was one that was like robbery, no question about it. We were outplayed <laughs> most of the night. Yeah. <laughs> Corey Crawford kept it at one nothing after that first period. That first period, it was as good as a team could play. Boston was all over us. We were just on our heels the entire period. Thankfully, get out of it one nothing. Great. Jonathan makes a nice play to tie it and then trailing in the game we in 17 seconds boom two goals let's get out of town as fast as we can with this stanley cup but it was a fun series pretty evenly matched teams and a series i'll always remember fondly for sure it was it, a funny thing about that is uh i remember i was walking down the hall and it, the, the, it, at the garden and you could like smell the champagne and the cigars and it was funny because two years earlier when we were smelling it in Vancouver it was like the best thing that we ever smelled and then there I was like oh, that's disgusting <laughs> <laughs> well I can't feel too bad for the fans and you guys up in Boston because there's plenty of championships over the years whether it's the Bruins or other sports teams so I don't feel bad stealing that one from you guys at all <laughs> Mike, do you when you when you see the when you cover the Bruins, uh, you know you're doing your job for NBC, and Catherine, you as well. You know, having seen what the Bruins organization, uh, how they handle their business and and the way they play, what what do you guys think makes them so successful? Starts with personnel, of course, and, and they've had. You know, Patrick talked about the core in 2013. Well. It's still there. I mean, Bergeron is there, Krejci is there, Char is there, Rask is there. I mean, this is a group that's been together for a long time. But in addition to that, they've been able to add guys like Brandon Carlo or Charlie McAvoy or Corey Krug. I forget what year Krug came in, but he certainly blossomed into a terrific player. So uh, in addition, guys like DeBrusque up front, I mean, they have they've been able to despite the fact that they probably look back on the one year that they had, I think, three first-round draft picks or three very high draft picks, and none of them have really been all that successful. Um, they have done a terrific job of drafting and accumulating talent, and, and uh, I think that's first and foremost. that Everything follows from the guys on the ice. You know, it's easy to do business and sell tickets when the guys are winning hockey games. It's a lot tougher when the going is rough and the team is under 500. Yeah, and I would just add to that too, guys, that, you know, when you play in a city like Boston and you play in front of a fan base that's, you know, as passionate and as educated as Bruins fans are for generations, I mean, there's a sense of, I have no doubt, and I didn't play, Sharpie could probably speak to this, but I mean, there's a sense of ownership as a player that you want to perform every single night. I mean, guys want to play in cities like Boston, Chicago, Philly, all these big championship cities because you have that passion of the fan base. And, um, you know, aside from the managerial side that Mike was talking about and from the top to the bottom and getting good players, those good players also have to perform. And they know that they're on a big stage when they're in a big city like that. So, I mean, it's fun as a broadcaster to cover too because we're all held accountable as well uh, at the national level, but also when you're doing it locally, which I did for so many years um, in Boston, you know those fans know what they're talking about uh, or, or think they know what they're talking about, but they're going to hold you accountable. And there's a set, certain level, like a different bar that you raise when you're in that environment. Right. And then, you know, we're kind of moving around a little bit. And we're thinking, boy, the, you know, these teams are getting ready to head out. They're, they're leaving their home base. And in that regard, Mike Milbury is a little bit of an innovator, Patrick. Back in, I think, 1990, he took the whole team, even though they were at home, he put them up in a hotel. This little place, I think it was, was it the town? I don't even know if that was a hotel. <laughs> no. It was a motel. It was, it's still there. It's a welfare motel. And it was, uh, we were playing the Canadians. We won the first two, lost the second two, and I didn't like the way things were going. So I had them come to this nice posh hotel in Winfield, and then I uh, had them get on the bus. So they all drove there, so they had no cars left. And then we drove to the practice ring, 
where I sort of spit at them for about an hour and a half. I didn't work them too hard because I knew they, you know, they didn't need to skate that much. But then we got on the bus and instead of going back to the posh hotel, we went to the town line in and the bu everybody got off the bus and I had them meet in the uh, middle of this tiny little lobby. And I brought out old pictures of players uh, that I had played with, you know, guys like O'Reilly. So there's a guy that showed up to play hard every night. Cashman, there's another guy that showed, that showed up to play every night and showed him all these old pictures. And uh, I said, you guys got to talk amongst each other and see if you want to get this thing straightened out. So then I went outside and I was with Ted Sater and Gordy Clark, my assistants. And I said, I can't, can I make these guys actually stay in this hotel? <laughs> and, uh, and, and they said, You're, we've gone so far, let's just keep going. Okay, so I had scouted the place out a little, and there was a nice little Italian restaurant around the corner. So around 6 o'clock, all of us went over. We had a nice, nice meal, chatted a little bit. And then I looked over at Dave Poole, and he looked like he was going to die. He was like just <laughs> white as a ghost. I said, Dave, you can go home because I needed my checking center. I said to Andy Moog, you, know, you can go home, get some rest. Of course, I said to Ray Bork, you can go home and get some rest. But I didn't say that to Cam Neely. And I didn't say that to Craig Janney and a whole bunch of other people. And after the dinner, I mean, the, the selection process was completely random. And to this day, if you ask Cam Neely, he's still, he's still pissed off about it, that he didn't get to go home. So everyone went back to their rooms like they were triples, I think, and uh, tiny little beds, <laughs> crappy little motel. And I went back to my room <clears throat> and, um, Actually got propositioned at one point by some kind of good-looking lady. <laughs> I said, not tonight, maybe some other day. <laughs> and I got in my car, drove home, and went to bed myself. <laughs> oh, you went home. <laughs> you went home. <laughs> and so, we won the next night. We won the yeah. series. So I don't know if it made any difference, but it got their attention and, and uh, certainly was a memory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. So what's the follow-up for that one? Yeah, I know. Well, it's funny because, Patrick, you may or may not know, Mike had tweeted out a story about how the hardest hit he ever took was from Cam Neely when Neely's, like, first practice with the Bruins after he got traded. So Milbury got his revenge. It took a long time, but he finally got him, you know? That's awesome. That's great. I don't have any Joel Quenville stories like that. We didn't have to do anything uh... – like that, but I can't compare to you, Mike. Thank God I didn't play for you. I would have been on that first bus home, man. I would have got out of there as fast yeah. as I could. Yeah, you know what? I mean, that was an exception. We had that year, and I think the following year, just coached two years in Boston before I became full-time management. Those guys had so much fun. We all had so much fun. You know what it's like when you're playing at a high level and, you know, they out to dinner on the road every night and, and sticking together and, being ticked off at me together. It was, uh, it was it's just fun to have a team come together. And sometimes you have to do something a little bit off the wall to make sure you get their attention. And that was one of those desperate measures for desperate times. I do like one of the tactics you used, showing pictures of the older players. Uh, because, I don't know, I never played for the Bruins, but I've been in the league a long time. And from the outside looking in, you hear so much about the Patriot way with the New England Patriots in Boston. Well, I feel like there's a Bruin way as well. And to bring it to the 2020 team, that culture sets the tone. You know, did you, you tell yeah. me that if you're messing around, if you're not a good teammate, if you aren't pulling the rope, if you're a passenger in that group, that you're not going to get called out inside that locker room. It's the best players is the core group. And the core group leads the way in every single aspect of the game. And that's why they managed to, to kind of be a top team for as long as they have. You, you know what Catherine was talking about, the pressure of playing in some of the big cities. And, and um, you're talking about the kind of culture. And it really goes back to Harry Sinden, all the way back to the late 60s when the team was terrible and they finally pulled it together when Orr arrived. Big trade with Chicago to get Esposito. But there was always uh, – Harry used to say, there's, there's a reason to play the game every night. And, you, and it's not bridge you can't pass. I mean, it was it was a philosophy that I I took to heart, and I think everybody took to heart. I think he passed it on to guys like me, Liam Sweeney, who are still there. And still, a couple of years ago, you know, the Bruins felt they got maybe pushed around a little bit. They immediately went out, got some tougher guys. They know they want to play to that aspect of the crowd, and I know that that's the style that they've adopted, and it's been there for a long time, and I, I think it started with Harry. 
Hey, hey, Sharpie, just a quick question to follow up on that. You, you know, you talked about your team kind of – when you're when your team that's a little more skilled, uh, how do you carry the play in the a way A little more want? skilled. A little more skilled. <laughs> the Hawk teams were ridiculous. They were, they, you know, the Fair enough. What, five, fall, their, five Hall of Famers were saying? Yeah, the, the Edmonton Oilers in their heyday and, – and by the way, I'm glad Kevin Lowe made the Hall of Famer. I think he deserved it. Uh, and the uh, Chicago Blackhawks during their run recently are the two most favorite teams I've ever had the pleasure to watch. And your puck possession, skating skill was, uh, you know, what the game is all about these days. I appreciate that. Those are nice, kind words. And I would have to pass it forward to the people that kind of put that team together. You know, I look at the Detroit Red Wings team. That was beaten up on the early Blackhawks group in like 2006 to 2010. Uh, it was ugly. We played against each other a lot preseason, eight times in the regular season back then. And it, that talk about Hall of Famers, those were the teams with like, you name it, everybody on the Red Wings was a Hall of Famer. And no matter how you played against the Red Wings, you couldn't get them to engage in any stuff after the whistle. There was very <laughs> few fights one-on-one -on -one throughout the course of the season, let alone a game. And they just played hockey. That was their strength. They had the puck on their stick. They kept the puck all game long. You just chase these guys around. You never get hit. And it was really the first team that we felt could just maintain their style of play throughout an entire game. And that's kind of what we did with the Hawks team. But, I mean, although we got a lot of credit for being a skilled, finesse team, and there are some awesome players that have great moments, like we had some guys in those early years that had some bites in them, and we did play a physical brand of hockey. Teams knew that we were skilled, so they tried to beat us up. They tried to get us to play physical, and, and we were able to do that as well. But I think our advantage was definitely speed and, and making plays with the puck. Yeah, I didn't mean to slight you in the toughness department. Who can forget uh, Duncan Keith over at David Backus yelling, wait, wait, right? <laughs> <laughs> he, st he still says he's still standing strong that that didn't happen. So I go, oh, my God. I don't if know I, who if said If I can lead his ribs, lips, anybody can. <laughs> wakey wakey very clearly yeah yeah he, he, he's a bad man on the ice for sure that duncan keith so we're gonna we're gonna switch it up a little bit now we always come up with some hacky name for the quick question segment so we're calling this one odd man rush because the odd man is starting it off so i'm gonna ask you patrick which would be worse having to play against or play for mike milbury <laughs> i don't know that's a good one i would have to say I'd rather play against Mike Milbury because I could avoid him throughout a game, hopefully, you know. I don't think he'd be on the ice when I'm on the ice, right, Mike? He'd probably be just watching when I got out there. Uh, uh, and, uh, I don't know. If he was I my mean, coach, he'd have too much power over me, and I'd have to listen to him, and he could uh, I think make that's me the stay wrong at these bad myself. hotels. I'm going to oh, go yeah, upstairs and get one of my old Shorewoods and see how heavy it is because all I have to be <laughs> is within six feet of you and make an impact. Oh, that 7030, that old PMP 7030, that Sherwood? <laughs> Good God, that thing was like a telephone pole. How many vertebrae did you break with that thing? <laughs> you know, what we did then was really criminal. I mean, I, 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 it was criminal. You could not come close to that. In front of the net was cross-checking as hard as you can was entirely acceptable, and I was happy to do it. <laughs> my, my real answer to the question, guys, would be uh... – an honest one that I wouldn't want to play for him. I wouldn't want to play against him. I'm happy being on Mike's team. He's been a good partner <laughs> oh, uh, these oh, years at NBC. Yeah. He's helped That's me out a lot. There you and, go. Uh, you were right. He's good. Yeah. I know. He, he appeals to the masses, Moose. Whatever you want to hear, Sharpie's going to give it to you. <laughs> no, I'm being serious. Mike was like one of the first guys I met at NBC. And I uh, never you met You were nervous, though, Sharpie. Admit it. When you first came oh, in the studio, a little time, nervous. Big time. I was nervous because I watch uh, NHL on NBC all the time. We were in the playoffs, so we were being covered nationally. And then I had not really met anybody except through the camera. And I walk in and see everybody on set doing their thing. Jonesy and Mike were in that day. Uh, Liam was there. Catherine, you were next door covering games. It was a lot to take in for sure. But I'm just going to tell the fans who think Mike's this big, bad, mean, tough guy. He was one of the first to reach out. I got his cell phone number. He said, let's go for lunch. Let's talk about the business. So... Maybe he doesn't want that image out there, that he's a nice guy and he looks out for his teammates, but he is he's that kind of teammate. I, I'll add one for you. He, Mike might not remember, but he bought me multiple beers at a Super Bowl with Mike <laughs> Felger. You, <clears throat> it, was right, it was right after Spygate. No, Deflategate. 
and we had a few conversations about that. Mike always had a take. I don't know if you remember. Do you miss Felger, by the way, uh, uh, Mike? Yeah, I, I get to see him once in a while. Of course, he and, and Maz are on every day if you happen to be in the car. Or my son is a big fan, so he's, he's got them on the simulcast once in a while. But uh, a we had a good time with Felger. Him. Actually, my, a lot of my opinions are close to Felger's, although when he gets on the radio, it's a little too off the wall for me sometimes. i got one more for you, Mike. Um, I hear from your Twitter – that you're a down Abbey fan. And I am. So, I've actually been there. This is incredible to, to us. We I were a little to, surprised. Uh, we went to uh, London and, and visited uh, Oxford and Cambridge, and we spent the day. My, my daughter was going to Cambridge University at the time, and uh, we met up with her husband and, and son, and we spent the day at Highclere Castle and around, uh, and around the town that they filmed everything. They had they, – where they – principally film is just you can't believe how small it is and how tight it is but one of the buildings main buildings is the library and there's librarians selling all all sorts of memorabilia from Downton Abbey and uh we we were in there moseying around for a while stopped for lunch at the the trout and frog it was a Sunday dinner it was one of the best meals I've ever had and then we headed to the castle itself and uh it's a magnificent place I mean it thousands of acres of farmland and uh, the place itself was just a, a marvel to behold. So yeah, I'm a big fan. So I guess it's fair to ask, Mike, you're kind of the, the senior member of this crew. Are, are we calling you the, uh, the Dowager Countess of this crew? Or <laughs> Lord of the Manor is more like it. Okay. <laughs> Catherine and Patrick, are you a little surprised that Mike's favorite show is, is Downton Abbey? No, not at all. Not at all. Oh, doesn't doesn't okay. no nope, doesn't surprise me. He's a, Mike loves to watch. I mean, every day there's something new that he's like, "Have you seen such and such?" Or you need to go watch this movie. He's very well read, very into the TVs and shows. And we spend a lot of time on the road to you know you you have to occupy your time somehow. So yeah, and I just got my first. I just got my first Manny Petty in about six weeks. <laughs> oh, thank God. Thank God for that. Oh, yeah, another fun fact of Mike, yes. He has nicer <laughs> manicured hands than I do. <laughs> Catherine, I got a follow-up for you. Who is um, least likely of all these guys you work with to pick up the check? Oh. <laughs> we know the answer to that, KT. He's not on the call right now. <laughs> um yeah i don't know if i should plead the fifth on this one or yeah it, uh i mean they're all pretty generous so uh, I, wish, I wish keith jones this one bald call. guy i might mention yeah <laughs> it's too bad keith jones couldn't make this call yeah, it's by really the way. too bad jonesy bailed on us today but um yeah yeah, yeah. okay fair enough Catherine's too nice. She's too nice to say it, guys. <laughs> I gotta go back on the air with these guys in a couple weeks. Um, no, they're all they all treat me well. Of course, of course. <laughs> Moving it forward a little bit to what's actually about to happen with the hockey, they're starting to buckle down a little bit now. It looks like training camps start next week, and so Patrick. You know, a lot of the talk in the Boston media, a lot of people say, oh, Tuka Rask isn't the guy to bring the Bruins to the promised land here. Uh, you know. I mean, you played against them. You know, you guys won a cup against them. I mean, what's your take on that in particular? And, I mean, do you, do you see the Bruins coming out of the East or the East? Do you see them coming out of Toronto, I think, and making a push for the cup? Do you think they have it? They're one of the teams for sure. If, you, if you're asking me who's going to win, I mean, I felt like I had a better grasp of things back in February and March. You could see teams starting to wind things up for the playoffs. You know, there's probably five to eight teams that we could all kick around in different order, and we'd all have pretty much the same idea of what's going on. Boston's one of those teams, and one thing about the Bruins is that more than any other team in the league, they were as consistent all season long. You know, Washington got off to a great start. They had a little bit of a dip. All these teams have taken step backs, whether it's injuries, whether it's long season, whatever. For a team like Boston that went as far as they did last year, can't go any farther, to pick up where they left off and just keep chugging along, I think they were probably a team that was, you know, hurt the most with this little stoppage and then we're going to resume. Everyone's going to have healthy teams now. But, yeah, Boston's – they've got all the tools to get to the cup final again. And Tuka Rask would be my guy. Who else do you want to play in that for you if you're in Boston right now? You know, I know he doesn't have the cup 
uh, as a starting goaltender beside his name, but he's pretty good, man. He's gotten to the finals a few times. And they have a nice combination going there with him and Halak. He's rested. He's ready to go. <laughs> I never really understood, you know, the negative talk towards Tukarask in the town of Boston. I mean, I, I guess I can see it from a fan's perspective. But, man, watch the guy play, Tukarask. He's had a great career. He's at the top of his game now. He's getting a lot of consideration for the Vesna Trophy. Uh, he didn't even play a whole lot of games this season. So, yeah, I, I would believe in Tukarask. He'd be my guy if I'm in Boston for sure. Yeah, one other like, question for you, Patrick, about the Bruins. As much as they had momentum going, they have Char at 42 or 3, and Bergeron's 36 now, I think. Krejci's around 35. Tuka himself is 32. Don't you think the rest will help them going into a playoff run as much as it's hurt the momentum? Don't you think they, they're in a better position to have their older veterans rested? Those guys, yeah, probably because the names you just mentioned, you can – count on them 100% to be ready to go when it starts. They take care of themselves off the ice. But if I had to give an advantage to a younger player or an older player when this thing starts up again, I'd probably lean towards the younger legs. You know, these guys go home. Some of them are living with their parents at home. They're in comfortable situations. They're thinking hockey. They're training. They're finding ways to stay active all the time. Not saying the veteran player doesn't do that, but I'm 38, and the idea of getting in game shape without my teammates around – you know, throughout this whole shutdown, that's a huge task. And you want to be ready to go because you have a couple bad games, all of a sudden the series can be over and you're headed back home. Catherine, I'll, I'll kick this one off with you. Do you guys have a team or a couple of teams that you feel strongly will get through and play for the Cup? I mean, for me personally, it's like what Sharpie said. I mean, we kind of had a better grip on things back in March. But, I, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, the younger teams are going to be better, the older team. I think it's going to be a nice blend. Whatever team has that, you know, the blend of the veteran mm. presence that can keep these guys motivated in a quarantine bubble situation for two months or three months. Um, I love St. Louis. I mean, I think there is there is no reason to doubt what they have. And, you know, the leadership started with Craig Ruby. It's, it's incredible. Um, but I also like teams, you know, don't – in the East, Columbus getting, you know, great players back in the lineup that were hurt. Seth Jones. I love uh, the Rangers' chances, too. I think a lot of New York fans were kind of hoping. I mean, they've got three goaltenders to choose from right now. What a horrible problem to have, right? <laughs> All three can do well. Our Temi Panarin was just absolutely in his rhythm when this whole thing ended. So uh, I think there's going to be some teams that you're surprised by. But when you look at a, a team like St. Louis, there's just – really no reason to doubt them and you know the pedigree that they've got uh, I, I don't know I think that they'll probably be one of the teams maybe with Colorado out west but again I mean we listen I'm throwing spaghetti against the wall here I mean we, sure. have, to see, we have to see how these guys look when they come back and what it's yeah, like not, for them to be totally sequestered you know not to mention the return of Vladimir Tarasenko uh, mm -hmm. who apparently is in better shape than he's ever been after yeah. his shoulder problem that's a huge plus for them and and you got to think about Tampa Bay with Stamkos in the mix now. So some of those guys in Pittsburgh, Gensel comes back, I guess. And so this is changes the whole dynamic. And it's really uh, people are maybe making predictions, but it's going to be it's going to be as it unfolds day to day, week to week. If you see this yeah. thing, we're in really different or different era. I look at the teams, guys, that are like don't think all star game skill. Think. Workmanlike attitude, straight lines, get on the forecheck and play that simple, hard style of hockey. I think they're going to have the most success when this thing starts up again. Teams like Carolina, I wouldn't want to play against Carolina. They got big, fast forwards. They hit everything in sight. Dougie Hamilton's back. Their goaltenders are healthy. You know, a team like Columbus that KT mentioned, Tortorella has those guys just finishing checks all over the ice. And when you're coming back off a long layoff, you watch preseason hockey. Guys, it takes a while. It takes a, t a few times to get hit. So everyone's got to wake up a little bit. Otherwise, you're just passing the puck around the outside. I look at those teams that have the good coaches that have a handle on their guides that play hard in your face and you have the most success early. Yeah, one other injured guy coming back too, Seth Jones. They're mm -hmm. talking about Columbus. I mean, that guy was a beast during the season until he got hurt. He's, a, he's one of the top defenders in the game right now. And that, adding that to the Columbus mix is a, is a real positive, a positive for their team. I think I said Seth Jones, didn't I? I think I yeah, said it. You got it in Did there. you? I didn't miss it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know I don't right. always I'll pay you attention know. to you, Catherine. <laughs> are you guys excited? Uh, what are we looking for from, from the NHL, NBC coverage? Uh, what, what can we expect from you guys? 
Well, I'm dying to get back on air and be with mm -hmm. these guys. Um, I think it's going to be awesome. I think, you know, we have an opportunity with uh, whenever sports do come back and we're hoping that, you know, the NHL will be back in that August 1st range, but we have an opportunity to bring so much happiness and joy to people that have just been craving it for so long. I mean, sports, is that what I do? Sports, <laughs> not you, but just in general, I mean, people are going to want to watch, people are going to want to be engaged. Even maybe we're going to get some fans that never watched hockey before who become a fan because it's what's relevant and it's what's happening now, but I'm excited to be with these guys. I know it's going to be different in the studio. I mean, we've got other restrictions and, um, you know, our meetings are going to be different. Our studio setup is going to be different. It's going to be a challenge because you've got to weigh all these other variables now, in addition to knowing your job and knowing your material. But I think you're going to get a great sense of energy. It's going to be fun when we're back and probably some bantering as well as there usually is. <laughs> We've made, we have to make up for lost time. <laughs> you know, it's funny though. Uh, Patrick was just talking about the players getting into a rhythm. It's, it's, it's the same for the broadcasters, too. We haven't done this in a long time. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we're going to see some new faces. The rosters are expanded. Things are going to be a lot different. And, and uh, it may take us a little while, but I know we'll get there. Yeah. And, and she's right. It's you going know to be fun. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, what's crazy is the trade deadline happened short, like a week before this whole thing happened. So I've actually had to remind myself of where certain players are on teams. I mean, because we really didn't get to even see them play on their new teams yet. So... That's going to be Great a learning point. curve. It's, yeah, there's going to be a lot. There's going to be a lot. Yeah, it's tough from the broadcaster standpoint. It's almost like a new season. It really is. KT yeah. mentioned it. Players are in new spots. you got to kind of remember what happened back in February, although things are going to be totally different with this unique format going forward. I'm most concerned getting back in the studio, guys, because I did get an email from NBC that, we got to do hair and wardrobe on our on our own, and that's a huge part of my <laughs> great my work <laughs> there at NBC. I need the best hair and makeup people. Well, you better get to started on, on it right now, Pat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just keep well, the tan going, and you won't need any makeup. Just keep the natural glow tan. <laughs> I love it. It's this a good was awesome, hair. guys. You have too much hair, man. <laughs> yeah, too much hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, awesome. This is great. Thank you so much. And we cannot wait to see you guys back on TV. Thanks for joining us. And we cannot wait for hockey to be back. Thank you, guys. Good to see you guys. All right. Thanks, see ya. Thanks.